Welcome to tonight's gathering, where we will hear from Austin Arbery, the author of a deeply researched, well-informed, and highly praised new biography of Pope Francis. I am John Carr. I am the director of the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life here at Georgetown. We are pleased to co-sponsor tonight's discussion with the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. Our colleagues at the Berkeley Center have been extraordinarily helpful to our new initiative, and we are honored to collaborate on this timely and important session. I especially want to thank Tom Banchoff, the director of the center, Aaron Taylor, Aaron Shevlin, Randolph Pelser, and the Berkeley team that has helped us find our way here and that has done the work that has made tonight possible. As some of you know, uh, the initiative has sponsored a number of major public dialogues and some separate sessions for young Catholic leaders in public life that have focused in many ways on the vision, the message, the leadership of Pope Francis and its challenges for lay leaders. We focused on politics, on poverty, on uh, partisanship, uh, humanitarian intervention. Some would say uh, we've been somewhat shameless, actually, in uh, focusing on the Holy Father. But I, given our focus on Catholic social thought, I think that is appropriate. Pope Francis is a walking, talking summary of Catholic social thought in action. At one of our first dialogues, uh, Michael Gerson of the Washington Post said he is not a Catholic, but as an outsider, he said, I think your new pope is a troublemaker. And we sort of laughed nervously. And he said, there's nothing more dangerous than a troublemaker with a plan. Austin compelling biography explains the making of this troublemaker and the elements of his plan. Our leader, our partner, and our host for tonight is Paul Eli, a senior fellow at the Berkeley Center and director of the American Pilgrimage Project in partnership with the StoryCorp Corporation. His unique work deals primarily with the ways religious ideas are given expression in religion, the arts, and culture. Paul is best known for two remarkable books on the encounter of religious belief and modern forms of art and communication. His first was the award-winning book, The Life You Save May Be Your Own, An American Pilgrimage, which was a remarkable group portrait of four 20th century Catholic authors, uh, Flannery O'Connor, Walter Percy, Thomas Merton, and Dorothy Day. His second book, Reinventing Bach, was about the transformation of Bach's music by great musicians of our time. One of the things probably less known about Paul is he has written, I think, the longest, most substantive article about the workings of the Vatican in an American magazine. Uh, in the, at the time of the transition between Pope John Paul II, his death, and the election of Pope Benedict, he wrote an 18,000-word essay, front-page essay, for Atlantic Monthly on so, sort of the dynamics and the meaning of that transition. And I'm told that when Paul was researching this effort, he came across a, a British journalist, a Vatican analyst, and a Catholic leader named Austin Arbery. That friendship has led to tonight a welcome opportunity to share, for Austin to share with us and to answer our questions about the influence and values that shaped a Jesuit priest and Argentinian bishop named Jorge Bergoglio and the factors that led to a surprise election as Pope and the unique elements of his leadership. So Paul and Austin, are going to continue a conversation that really began a decade ago. And to introduce Austin, I'd like to ask you to join me in welcoming Paul Levi. Thank you very much, John. It's a privilege to co-host this event with you, the first that we've done together, and I hope the first of many. 
as John said, uh, I've known Austin Ivory for a number of years. When we came to know each other, we were focused on um, trying to figure out what was going on at the Vatican and trying to figure out on top of that how to uh, know something and tell something that um, everybody else wasn't telling. Half the challenge of covering the Vatican is uh, getting around the usual news feed and obvious press conferences to come up with a real story. And there were a couple of strategies to doing that. And one is to uh, talk to more people than anybody else. And the other is to uh, wait it out a bit and let uh, um, day journalists rush to their deadlines and hang back so you have an opportunity to do something deeper. That's what I tried to do with my pieces for The Atlantic. And that um, emphatically is what Austin's done with The Great Reformer. It's not late, certainly. It's only uh, less than two years into Francis' pontificate. But suddenly, we have the story that I know, the story that I've really wanted to know ever since Francis was elected. Uh, not just who is he, but who was he? Where does he come from? Uh, how does the pontificate that we've seen unfold before our eyes uh, have roots in his work in Latin America, uh, in his role as a Jesuit and as an, uh, uh, a man of Argentina? And there's nobody uh, better equipped to tell that story to uh, English-speaking readers than uh, Austin Ivory. And I feel uh, grateful to you for the book. And I'm going to refer to it again and again and uh, probably steal from it a little bit. So uh, uh, with no further ado, please uh, come and tell us a little bit about Pope Francis. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I began today in New York having breakfast with Cardinal Dolan talking about Pope Francis, which was great fun. And here I am in Georgetown University. So I, I feel very, very blessed and very, very grateful. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, particularly blessed to be introduced by Paul. And of all the endorsements that the book's got, uh, Paul's there at the back makes me feel very proud because I'm a huge admirer of his. Um, so lovely to be with you. Um, I uh, just want to briefly tell you before uh, we go, we dig into one of the issues in the book, uh, why I came to write the book. Uh, I am an example of how a PhD can be useful. <laughs> because 23 years ago, I did my, my DPhil, as it's called in Oxford, uh, my doctorate on the church and politics in Argentina which um, everybody, of course, at the time, including me, thought was, uh, was uh, an indulgence and an obscurity. Uh, but there I was on the night of the 13th of March, 2013, commentating for Sky News when an Argentine came out on the balcony uh, of St. Peter's. And I suddenly realized that um, I knew this man's country. I had dealt for many years, living in Buenos Aires over a period of two years, dealt with all kinds of complexities to do with Argentina, nationalism and Peronism and the relationship of church and politics and the dictatorship and so on. And that I wanted those questions answered. How did he fit into all of those? What positions did he take? And I waited for the biography that would, uh, would explain those things, and I didn't see it. And I began to see why, which is that there are actually very few people who, if you like, understand Argentina and also can communicate that to a kind of Anglo-Saxon audience that the, the existing biographies, most of them are by Argentines, tend to take for granted the Argentine background. So I'm convinced, and, and I hope the book shows it, that just as you wouldn't try to understand John Paul II without understanding Poland, uh, that you can't understand Jorge Mario Bergoglio without uh, understanding Argentina. But um, even so, it was still a rather audacious thing for me to want to do because I'd never written a biography before. Um, and I was um, in St. Peter's Square uh, in June last year, and I happened to have front row tickets, I say this in the prologue, front row tickets for the general audience. I'd got them through by, by giving a speech uh, in Sydney, and anyway, there was a cardinal there. It doesn't matter, I had front row tickets. Now, under Benedict, under Benedict, if you had front row tickets, you know, you were in luck, because as soon as he had finished speaking, he would come down and greet you, he'd come down the row, and of course, you were very privileged, he would spend time with you. But under Francis, the front row ticket holders are not the priority. Francis, of course, having done his, um, his wonderful stuff, uh, the, the, the direct speech in the square, then disappeared for two hours among 
uh, the people he calls God's holy faithful people, the ordinary people, as it were, not the front row ticket holders. They were his priority. And by the time he got to us, uh, I say all this in the prologue, you know, he was hot, he was sweating, it was a hot day. He was giving off this extraordinary energy, which I describe in the prologue as a biblical blend of sort of serenity and joy, really, really compelling energy. And um, I said a few words to him, as did my colleague, Pope Francis didn't say anything back. My wife is convinced it's because I didn't let him get a word in edgeways. <laughs> uh, but generally, he doesn't. He does actually just listen. He's a great listener. But one thing he did was he put his, his hand on my wrist quite firmly all the time that we were speaking to him. And afterwards, I somehow just took that as encouragement. I thought, yep, that's it. I'm going to write this biography. So there we are. A few months later, I found myself in Argentina, uh, spent five weeks there, uh, interviewed possibly 80 people, um, 25 of them were Jesuits. And uh, um, the story, in a way, ends a, a couple of weeks ago, 10 days ago, I was in Rome for the Rome launch of this book, and I was able to go to Mass at the Santa Marta uh, at 7 o'clock. Uh, I went to Mass with Pope Francis and afterwards was able to present him with the book. Now, here's a challenge. You've written a biography about the Pope, and you're presenting it to the Pope, what do you write as a dedication? <laughs> so I had my first experience of writer's block, you know, <laughs> in the course of this book. Uh, and there are a few uh, copies which, which uh, I've kept because they're the dispensed ones. Here's what I wrote. I wrote, Holy Father, I know that you dislike the idea of books which focus on you, that you prefer to deflect the attention where it belongs. I hope this book does that. That's what I wrote in Spanish in the book. He didn't actually look at it. <laughs> he just received the book, passed it. He looked quite startled, actually, passed it to his secretary, and then, sp and then looked at me, looked at my wife, and spoke to us, and again, very encouraging words. He was more interested, in other words, in us than in a book about him, which I think says a lot about him. What does the Pope think? With the case, with, with John Paul II, we knew he was a philosopher, we knew what school he belonged to philosophically, personalism and so on. Again, with Joseph Ratzinger, a theologian with a huge number of books behind him before he became a pope. But what does Pope Francis think? What is his intellectual heritage? And this is one of the questions I wanted to explore in the book. Um, he, as you probably know, started a PhD uh, but never finished it. Uh, but uh, he left a very large number of articles of spirituality articles. He's not a theologian. He's not a philosopher. He's above all a master of Ignatian spiritual discernment. And he wrote many, many articles, and I knew this before I arrived in Argentina, about spirituality and discernment. I arrived in Cordoba, which was the, the, the city uh, in Argentina, where, of course, he spent quite a lot of time. And I went to see the Jesuits there, and I said, where are all these spirituality articles? I presume you know, there are, I haven't seen any in the bookshops. And uh, they pointed, they brought down these books from the shelf. There are three volumes uh, published in the, in the 1980s and the third one in 1992. Three volumes, substantial volumes of collections of all his articles. Now, th these were out of print books, long since out of print. Uh, they were only ever one edition, very small print run. And I was amazed because this was uh, sometime seven months after his election. I assumed that they would, have, they would have done new editions, but not at all. So I literally took these books and I went and photocopied them. You can do that in Argentina. Uh, and, and that forms the basis, really, of the first uh, part of the book. Nobody else has done that. Nobody has dug into these articles. So uh, yeah, this, was, this was a treasure trove. And what it shows is what emerges from these articles is a series of themes and I began to realize that here is a man who has actually dedicated his life intellectually to one thing, really, uh, if you can boil it down, which is a spiritual discernment of how institutions and bodies are united and why sometimes they can end up in division and schism. And I began to realize in reading these articles, this actually is his life's work. This is him. And that, that's why I ended up calling the book the great reformer, because reform has been his, his life's work as a Jesuit provincial, as an archbishop, uh, and now at po as pope. And that this isn't just a vision of church reform. It's also about how institutions in general uh, can be built up, how to avoid 
the division and conflict within institutions, and that this has tremendous lessons for public life, for politics, and in fact, later in his life, uh, he, he, in a series of important talks, the, te the annual Te Deum in Buenos Aires, I realized again, connecting these two things, that he was offering a vision of a political culture. So I, that's what I want to just say a few words about tonight, and I'm going to read you a couple of passages from the book. But just very quickly, because we're going to have a Q&A, I want to tell you what I think also is in the book, which perhaps is distinctive or has not been covered before. Obviously, it's the story of Argentina, the story of Argentina's own drama, the story of Peronism, of the culture clash in Argentina between liberalism and nationalism, the Catholic nationalist understanding of liberation theology called Teología del Pueblo, which is people's theology, which he was very much a part of, that school. Um, and uh, then I think, I, I, I think what I do in the book also is give a proper context and understanding of the 1970s, the decade in which he came to be a very young provincial at the age uh, of, of 36, and how the country and indeed the Jesuits were politically divided, how Catholicism ended up on both sides of the divide, on the one hand, the guerrillas, and on the other hand, the security state uh, which defeated the guerrillas. Also, I wanted to understand in the book, and I felt instinctively that this was key, what happened between Jorge Bergoglio and the Society of Jesus? Why did he end up exiled in Córdoba for those two years? What went wrong? What was the split over? And I guess I spent a lot of my time in Argentina talking to Jesuits, working that through. It's a complex and fascinating and dramatic story which is told here for the first time. I also was fascinated by his leadership of the Argentine church as an archbishop during the period of collapse of the economy in the state in 2001, 2002, when he emerged as a major civic leader in Argentina, and when the reputation of the church uh, soared, the credibility of the church reached un, uh, unprecedented levels of credibility as a result of his leadership, and his vision for politics and society post that crisis. What's also in the book is the story, of course, of the conclave of 2005. Why did Bergoglio refuse uh, the attempt by a group of cardinals to, uh, to elect him pope? What went, why, why was it that he said over lunch, after his votes had reached 40, he told people not to vote for him? Also, the, another big story in the book, which hasn't been told before, is his leadership, his emerging leadership of the Latin American church, particularly in a Parisida, the great uh, meeting of CELAM, of the Latin American collegiate body, and the document which it produced, known simply as the Parisida document. And the way that Bergoglio conceived of a manifest, kind of a manifest continental destiny for Latin America, and specifically for the church in Latin America, as the future source for the universal church. And this is a, a big theme in the later chapters, above all because of his association with an extraordinary figure. By the way, if anybody wants to do a book or a study that needs studying, and he's called Alberto Metol Ferre. He's a Uruguayan uh, intellectual, the greatest Catholic intellectual of 20th century Latin America, uh, 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 very, very close to Bergoglio uh, and a fascinating man. He conceived of Latin America having this destiny that it was coming into being as the source for the universal church. And one of the surprising stories I tell in the book is how uh, Cardinal Ratzinger initially, when he was cardinal, but then as Pope Benedict, nurtured this, recognized this, and nurtured it, and could see that the Latin American church was emerging as the source for the universal church. Rather provocatively, one of the photos in the book shows Cardinal Bergoglio and Pope Benedict greeting each other and I've called it the handover. <laughs> because in a, in a strange way, you'll see from the book, Benedict, there's, there's a great continuity, in fact, between Benedict and Francis, and the whole way in which Benedict takes the decision to resign while in Latin America is all very powerful and symbolic. And then lastly, the story of the conclave of 2013, how he was elected. This is told systematically for the first time in this book. Um, and um, I don't know whether you've uh, noticed, but there's also already a bit of controversy about it. This was not arranged, I hesitate to add, by my publisher. Uh, 
the Vatican has made a statement about it already, which I, uh, I say I couldn't have arranged it. But actually, um, uh, I want to just clear something up tonight about this, uh, uh, and I am saying it, of course, to journalists who are asking. The Vatican is upset, or rather Father Lombardi has made a statement on behalf of the four cardinals who I describe in the book as effectively organizing the pro Bergoglio campaign. Now, what they're upset about is a line which I put in there, which I regret writing, or at least the, the phrasing, phrasing of it I regret, which is, uh, I said that this time, unlike 2005, that they sought his consent, now, or his assent. Uh, now, that implies that they actually went to him and said, would you be willing to be a candidate? And that never happened. And Cardinal Cormac, who was, of course, uh, Cardinal Cormac Murphy O'Connor, whom I used to work, was, of course, an important source for the book. Uh, when he read that, he said, you've got it really, really well, you know, it's all fine, except that line gives that impression. Now, because that kind of a deal prior to the conclave would be in violation of the conclave rules, uh, both Cardinal Cormac and these other cardinals have wanted to make it clear that no such uh, a deal, as it were, took place. And I'm happy to make that clarification. And what I, what I will say in future editions and future reprints is that this time they believed he would not resist his election. So I just wanted to clarify that. When you get to that line, it's at the top of page 355. Remember, <laughs> remember to replace it with this line that I've just told you about. So those are just a few of the stories that I think are in the book and we can return to uh, in the Q&A. Now, uh, at an event in, in the UK last week, um, a Jesuit who was very, very helpful in, in the book, I thank him at the back, he's the master of Campion Hall in Oxford, Father Jim's ha Jim, Jim Hanvey, uh, I asked him to give a reflection on the book. And he said something which uh, rather surprised me uh, and I hadn't thought about. The wonderful thing about writing a book is, of course, you find, you know, people find in it things that you hadn't realized. Um, he said that Francis's pontificate could be summed up by a passage on page 381. So I'm going to read it to you. Uh, because it, uh, since he said this, it has actually struck me that this, this is a, a, a very, very important. What is it about Pope Francis that, sorry, why is it that Pope Francis is so concerned with mercy? Why, among one of his first moves, was to declare a kairos of mercy, a God's time of mercy? We know that mercy runs as a big theme through his life. That's all in the book. But why now? What is it about this current age? Uh, and this is, what, uh, this is what I wrote. Francis's proclamation of a kairos of mercy stems from his discernment that a world being transformed by technology and wealth is prone, above all, to the illusion that human beings, not God, are sovereign. Mercy is the great antidote to progressive optimism as well as conservative pessimism, for it grounds its hope in God's forgiveness of our sins rather than our belief in our own resources. That's why the poor are quicker to grasp Francis than the rich and the educated, and why the opposition to Francis has come from elite groups invested in particular narratives. So I just want to spend a few minutes on, on the, this theme of institutional reform, which I think runs uh, like a thread throughout his life. It begins very early as a, as a Jesuit uh, in the wake of Vatican II. He was profoundly influenced, of course, by the Second Vatican Council. But he was also caught up with the Jesuit renewal, which followed the council, where there were various different ideas about what Jesuit renewal was. And he became very involved in that and was eventually made provincial in order to carry through a different version of renewal. So um, um, what he, he was part of a small group around an extraordinary man called Father Fiorito, who was, if you like, the master discerner of the Argentine province. Um, and they were concerned with what is a true reform. Um, there, there, was, um, there was an important text in 1950 by Eve Congar called True and False Reform in the Church. Uh, Pope John XXIII had it by his bedside when he called the Vatican Council. And Congar's text is, a, a text is effectively a discernment looking back through church history to ask why is it that some reforms have ended up in division and schism and others result in greater holiness and the kind of true reform which results uh, in greater unity, greater holiness, and so on. And this discernment had a profound impact on, on the young Jorge Bergoglio. I'm just going to read you a little bit. Congar found, 
And as you, hear, as you listen to this, think about what Francis is now doing in the church. Congar found that true reform was always rooted in pastoral concern for ordinary faithful people. It was oriented to and shaped by the periphery, not the center. In other words, it valued tradition, the Catholic constant such as Eucharistic worship, a teaching magisterium, devotion to the saints, and so on, which were valued by the ordinary faithful rather than the avant-garde elites. True reform sought to make the church more true to itself and was on guard against attempts to align it with contemporary secular movements such as nationalism in the 16th century or indeed Marxism in the 20th. Its fruits were a greater zeal and fidelity as well as unity. True reform attacked the spiritual worldliness that stopped the church from looking like and acting like Christ. This, in Bergoglio's reading, was the early Jesuit story, a reform that had revitalized the church by restoring its poverty, holiness, missionary focus, obedience to the Pope, unity, and it would be what, as a church leader from his 30s on, he dedicated himself to. That meant combating false reform, the converse of the true reform and its abiding temptation. False reform was driven by ideas in self-enclosed groups distant from the ordinary faithful. It rejected links and tradition and was vulnerable to or aligned with contemporary ideologies, producing reactions that ended in division and sometimes schism. This was the story of avant-gardism, enlightened elites who saw themselves entitled to impose or lead reforms according to particular ideas or ideologies, which always produced then a reaction, either from those with other ideas or from defenders of the status quo. With false reform, in other words, the church became a battleground of competing elite projects, and what followed were disunity and the loss of identity. Now, this is in fact really a, a description of the Jesuits in the 1970s, in Argentina and elsewhere, but particularly in Argentina, because the divisions over the renewal were accelerated and exaggerated also by the growing political uh, divide in the country. So he took over as provincial at a time when the province was losing vocations, people were leaving, and he was a kind of emergency appointment. He was appointed to deal with the crisis. Within a few years, he had turned around the vocations crisis. Uh, the province began filling up with young Jesuits, uh, and they stayed, and he really did turn the thing around. And how did he do it? That's the story that's told in the book, but it's really mapped out there by Congar. Focus on the ordinary faithful people, pastoral attention, uh, to, re to resist the temptation of ideology and focus on, on, on the poor and on the mission. And uh, that was really his renewal of the province was that, and I, I have a whole chapter talking about the amazing period in which, where the Jesuits still talk about today in Argentina, when he was rector of the Colegio Maximo, which was this huge uh, college where the Jesuits trained uh, in Buenos Aires province. But interestingly, that renewal would then provoke a reaction from the old guard in the Jesuits. I say the old guard. They were, did tend to be older, but more importantly, they tended to be the intellectuals, the progressives, uh, the social scientists, who were very alarmed by what they saw as Bergoglio's Salesianization, as they put it, of the province, turning Jesuits into Salesians. You know, that they, they had, so it's a fascinating story, but isn't it interesting that right there from the beginning, the people that resist him are, if you like, the enlightened elites, the intellectuals. Uh, and I think today, a lot of the cons growing conservative opposition to Francis reflects exactly the same thing. This, in this case, they're conservatives, then it would have been progressives. But in the same case, they were people who were attached, if you like, to particular ideas. Uh, and I'd better stop there in case I get into trouble. Um, the, 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 next, uh, the next passage I just want to read you uh, is, um, is, is, about his, is about his thesis. Now, uh, when he was, uh, after he had been rector, uh, the, new, the new general intervened very dramatically in the province. The story is told here for the first time, a very authoritarian intervention. Read about it for yourself. But the best solution at that moment was for Bergoglio to leave the country. So he went to Germany to, to begin a thesis on uh, Guardini. Now, he didn't finish the thesis. He came back to Argentina, uh, and the province remained in tension for many years, and it was eventually resolved by his expulsion. That story is told in the book. But just on his thesis, I want you to listen to this. Um, why did he choose Guardini? 
There were affinities. Guardini was the son of Italian emigres who studied chemistry and who remained faithful despite intense pressures, not least from Nazis, to his inner authority. Bergoglio's specific interest was in Guardini's early 1925 text, Der Gegensatz, Contrast, which was a critique of Marxist and Hegelian dialectics that Bergoglio believed could be useful for conceptualizing the dynamics of disagreement. Guardini's discussion drew on the work of a 19th century Tübingen theologian, Johann Adam Muller, who argued that in the church, contrasting points of view, Gegenschatze, are fruitful and creative, but can become contradictions, Widerspruch, when they fall out of unity of the whole and develop in opposition to the body. This was precisely the distinction drawn by Yves Congar in his discussion of true and false reform uh, in the church. His desire to explore Guardini's Gegensatz, in other words, was of a piece with his core underlying interest in politics and institutional reform and helped to shape what, as a cardinal, he would promote as a culture of encounter. So you see here, his academic study was precisely on this theme. And even though he never finished the thesis, he put it into practice uh, you know, in his church leadership uh, and later uh, in politics. I think I probably... Can I go on a little bit more, or shall I draw it to an end here? Yeah? So one more passage I just want to read you, which is the application of this to politics. Uh, when he was uh, Cardinal Archbishop of Buenos Aires, so we're talking about many years later, excuse me for leaping forward now, uh, he, he turned the annual Te Deum uh, celebration, which traditionally would be a moment when the church kind of blesses the nation, and the government's there and feels blessed at the same time. Uh, generally, the archbishop never said anything. You know, he just recited the prayers, and that would be it. Well, Bergoglio changed all that uh, because he used the opportunity to deliver a powerful and biting address to whoever was the president of the time. Here's a description of his 1999 Te Deum. Standing only feet from the current Menem and future De La Rua presidents and the cream of Argentina's political class, Bergoglio delivered a lengthy and biting address that combined Old Testament prophecy with the soaring rhetoric of a US presidential inauguration. Warning of current coming social disintegration while diverse interests maneuver alien to the needs of all, he reminded the nation of Argentina's genius and creativity, but also of its tendency to fratricide. In words almost identical to those he had used in addressing the Jesuits in 1974, he went on to speak of his Pueblo Fiel idea, the faithful people. Our people has a soul, he said, and because we can speak of a soul, so we can speak of a hermeneutic, a way of seeing, an awareness. Just as he had urged the Jesuits to abandon ideology and take on the values of the Pueblo Fiel, so he now called on politicians to spurn those who claim to distill reality into ideas, quote, the talentless intellectuals, the unkind ethicists, and to drink from the cultural reserves of the wisdom of ordinary people. This, he said, was the true revolution, to recover the values that made Argentines great, their love of life but acceptance of death, their solidarity in the face of pain and poverty, the way they celebrate and pray. Turning specifically to the politicians, he called on them to renounce their individual and partisan interests and to hear the call of the people for greater participation in civic life. We are all invited to this encounter, he concluded, to realize and share this ferment that, while new, is also the revivified memory of our greatest history of sacrificial solidarity, of social integration, and struggle for freedom. So what he's doing here is, again, he's, he's, he's combating the elites, the ideologies, inviting politicians to root themselves in the values of the ordinary people. It's a vision of the, of the state of government as serving the interests, of the, the soul of the nation. Uh, and he talked about the importance of the government building bonds, what we would say, if you like, the bonds of civil society. Uh, but, uh, but he would criticize the uh, Argentine politicians constantly for their ambition, for their partisan interests, for their seeking power, money, popularity. And this, he would say, expresses only an interior emptiness. And those who are empty do not create bonds. So here you see the idea, the vocation of a politician, and he himself as a churchman, as a church leader, the vocation to create the bonds on which civil society uh, depends. Um, the same uh, idea, you probably noticed, I don't know whether you heard much about it, 
but it was about a week ago, wasn't it, 10 days ago, he gave this extraordinary address in Strasbourg, becoming known as the, the grandmother's speech, because he said Europe was you know, old and tired like a grandmother. But actually, if you read that speech, it's bang on this. Everybody was saying this sounds like John Paul II. No, it's vintage Bergoglio. Again, denouncing, challenging the European institutions. You know, they've become detached from the ordinary faithful people, an invitation then to a, a vocation uh, of service. I think I'll leave it there because I know you've got lots to, to talk about and Paul's got lots of hard questions for me. Thank you very much. Austin. I have only two questions. One very short, the other would take the rest of our time. What were Cardinal Dolan's questions <laughs> about Pope Francis? And is Pope Francis coming to Georgetown? <laughs> well, the second question uh, has to be answered by you. Have you invited him? Uh, Cardinal Dolan's questions about Pope Francis. Um, he wanted to know whether he was a Peronist and whether his method of his style of governance was authoritarian, populist. And we basically had a fascinating discussion about the way Pope Francis at the moment governs the Vatican, which is deeply disconcerting if you're a Vatican bureaucrat. Um, and it is personalistic. And it is a strange paradox, actually, of on the one hand, wanting to devolve governance and power, collegiality, we can talk a lot about that. But on the other hand, actually, he reserves the right. I mean, you know, you know about the famous phone calls, for example, the phone calls to different countries speaking directly to people, bypassing in many ways the authority of the bishop. So there is a kind of, there is definitely a contradiction. Well, there's a tension there. There's a paradox rather than a contradiction. Um, but anyway, Dolan was very interested in what I had learned about that. And he had a few uh, interesting anecdotes of his own. One of the fascinating things he said was that, um, was that under John Paul II, you always knew how to get at him. You know, there was a secretary, there were, the, there were the channels of communication, right? If you wanted to get an audience with the Pope or arrange something, you knew who to speak to. Now nobody knows. <laughs> One story that stands out in the book speaks directly to what you say about Bergoglio's connection with the ordinary faithful. And it's a story of Mary Untire of Knots. Can you tell that story? Yeah, um, Maria de Satanudos in Spanish uh, is a devotion which has become a Latin American devotion, uh, particularly in Argentina, Uruguay, Paraguay, and Brazil, but was originally a German devotion. And when he was in Germany during this very difficult period when he had started his thesis on Guardini, uh, in a very tortured way, he went to pray before uh, this painting in, in Augsburg in Germany. Now, this painting shows uh, you look at it at first and you think it's just a picture of one of those standard portraits, 17th century portraits of the Virgin. But then you realize that what she's doing uh, is that there are, there are angels either side of her. One angel is passing her a silken thread full of knots, and she's untying the knots, and then the other angel is taking the untied threads. Now, Begoglio was deeply moved by this and found it a deeply prayerful experience to be in front of this picture. I don't know what knots he was seeking to untie, but I've taken a little bit of liberty in the book to imagine uh, what those might have been. But anyway, here's the thing. He brought back with him to Argentina these prayer cards. In fact, when he was made bishop, uh, all the other bishops, the, you know, when you're made a bishop, you give out usually a, a prayer card with a saint and so on. And he was giving out these prayer cards with this, with this painting on it. And everyone's thinking, what on earth is this? <laughs> well, a few, um, not that long afterwards, uh, these prayer cards started to appear. People started uh, praying to the, to the Maria de Satanudos. And then an Argentine copy of the picture was made. And suddenly a parish priest in, a, in Buenos Aires um, found himself with all these people that said, could they hang this picture there? And he kind of went, oh, well, all right. <laughs> hang this picture. 5,000 people turned up. Uh, and ever since then, it's grown. It's now a massive devotion. I mean, tens of thousands come to it. And that was a devotion which Bergoglio introduced to Argentina. We journalists, especially, are suckers for symbolism. And Francis had us from Francis when he called himself Francis. Then he had us a second time when he decided to uh, decline to live in the papal department. Now we're 18 months on. Francis is uh, a very powerful and clear voice for Catholic social teaching. 
social teaching that has existed consistently for a century in a certain way for a half century, emphasizing the preferential option for the poor, uh, the church as the church of the poor, the need for human dignity, and so forth. Uh, we've seen the symbolism. What we've heard Francis uh, enunciate that social teaching, what is happening to uh, put, put that social teaching into practice? Is it making a difference, the fact that he's so clearly in favor of it? Uh, what's the first thing that, that Francis does, the first trip that he makes uh, as Pope, uh, was to the island of Lampedusa, you remember the, the island off the coast of Italy, and there he, he lays a wreath in the sea, and he draws attention to the fact that migrants uh, leave Africa, they try to get into Europe, many of them capsize on the way. Uh, he was deeply moved, he didn't know that, by the way, before he became Pope, he learned about it and immediately spontaneously decided to go to Lampedusa. The second trip, uh, was to Sardinia, where he talked about the, the jobless. Uh, so uh, he gave a, a whole series of reflections uh, on, what, on the dignity of, of work and the importance of work and so on. Isn't it fascinating that among the first two things he does, it's migration and jobs. And those are the two things, actually, which, um, which the poor care about. Yeah? Uh, so it's not just about... Uh, I love Catholic social teaching. In many ways, I kind of came back to the church in my 20s when I discovered Catholic social teaching. But, in, but the problem with Catholic social teaching is that, of course, it is an abstract, it can seem very abstract to people, a series of concepts. I think part of what the option for the poor is, is simply spending time focusing on the issues which are of concern to the poor, which are not necessarily of concern to the middle classes. And, you know, employment and migration are the two massive themes uh, for the poor. He, of course, has known both in his own family, the child of immigrants, uh, grew up in a, in, a, in, a, in a pretty poor household. It was, it was, it was genteel poverty. Uh, but you know, shared the, the tragedy, the suffering, the hope of immigration, which, of course, you here in the New World, um, you know, you've all got stories in your own family. He grew up with that. Uh, and I think, um, so he has an in insti he has a, he has a knowledge of what the poor undergo and what the priorities for the poor are. And so I think that's a big part of what the option for the poor is. And I think, what is he doing for Catholic social teaching? Maybe he's grounding, helping to ground Catholic social teaching uh, in those very practical concerns. I spoke to somebody with some knowledge earlier today who said that the bishops have lost their voice when it comes to Catholic social teaching. They're still cowering because of the sexual abuse crisis. And even the strong voice of Pope Francis on Catholic social teaching cannot embolden them to uh, uh, take it up themselves. And one of the reasons for this, this person went on to say, is that uh, they are not convinced that the Pope is Catholic. Uh, ca can this be possible? One of the, uh, one of the paradoxes of Pope Francis's um, governance of the church at the moment is that, have you noticed that he doesn't intervene uh, on questions like gay marriage and so on? which affect particular states. So it used to be normal, wouldn't it, you know, when something was coming before the legislature, you'd get a statement from the Pope, which was designed to influence that national policy. So he believes very much in local bishops taking those decisions. In that sense, he's very collegial. But he's also happy to use his own influence uh, as a Pope in support of, in order to break new policy ground. And I think actually he has done that I'm avoiding your question, of course, because you asked me that. But, but he, has, he has done that in respect of immigration, because I know that the U.S. bishops want to use uh, and have already used Pope Francis's authority and prestige in this area to help to, to, to drive the immigration debate here in the U.S. And when he comes next year, as I understand it, that's one of the things that's going to be planned is a, a papal visit to the border, uh, which I think will have a huge impact. So, you know, I, I think he's, he's, he, he, will, he will help insofar as the U.S. bishops want him to. He's willing to do that. Thinking as a biographer about Pope Francis, I think the question of continuity and change, which is also a question that comes up again and again when you think about the Catholic Church, I say to myself, well, if this man was doing these things in this way, uh, how could it possibly uh, take 75 years for him to catch people's eye? Now, you attribute this to the fact that he wears an invisibility cloak, uh, but I know for a fact that the invisibility cloak does not work in Rome. <laughs> especially with 5,000 journalists there. Uh, the, the, 
story very compellingly and convincingly told in the book is that what we're seeing is what people have seen in Bergoglio all along. Uh, how can it be that, uh, that he could elude us well into his eighth decade? Is it just because we're Americans and we don't pay attention to what's happening in South America? Well, actually, I do think that does have quite a lot to do with it because Latin America um, is largely invisible, has been largely invisible. If you think about the way, for example, the church is reported, right? yeah. most of the Vaticanisti in Rome, the, the Vatican specialists, are either Italian or American uh, or European. Uh, and in fact, there, are very, there, there isn't much reporting on the Latin American church, which then feeds into the worldwide. Uh, uh, so that's partly the reason. Also, among the Latin American cardinals, he was, he was uh, very inconspicuous in, in Rome. I mean, first of all, he hated Rome. I mean, he didn't like coming to Rome. He would, he would quickly, you know, was, take Cardinal Rodriguez Maradiaga, for example, you know, articulate, fluent English speaker, plays the piano, he's a, he's a, he loves the press, he gives great, you know, uh, wonderful uh, extrovert man. So, you know, you think Latin American cardinal, you think Rodriguez Maradiaga. Bergoglio would never give interviews, uh, didn't speak English. So, yeah, he was largely invisible, actually, to our radar. But he wasn't invisible in Latin America by any means. By, by uh, 2007, particularly a Parasita, it's told in the book, was, was a breakthrough moment because they entrusted to him the task of redacting the final document. And I describe in the book how it happened and, and how he won the admiration of the Latin American church uh, through doing that. So I think he emerged as, the, as a Latin American church leader in Latin America, but that was largely invisible uh, to us. And also because he really, and I, I talk about his invisibility cloak, I mean, he really did flee the, uh, flee the limelight. But there is a consistent pattern throughout his life. When he became provincial of the Jesuits, age 36, when he was appointed an auxiliary bishop uh, in 1992, when he was then, to everybody's surprise, made the coadjutor archbishop of Buenos Aires to succeed Quaratino in 1998, and finally when he becomes pope, every single time, it's taken people by surprise. And I, I use this um, you know, metaphor of he's like a gaucho galloping in at dawn, you know, <laughs> taking everybody by surprise. And I wonder, I wonder why that's so. And I, I think it's partly his personality, but I think it's partly because he genuinely doesn't put himself forward. He genuinely doesn't. But on the other hand, he's very docile to what he would see as a movement of the spirit. So if he, you know, he's there, he's available, he's ready. And then if he believes that the Spirit is calling him, then he will allow himself to take that position. In 2005, you see, he was convinced in his own spiritual discernment that neither he nor the North Latin American church was ready. And he didn't want to be seen as the anti-Ratzinger anti uh, candidate. And he, what he feared, what he saw happening actually in the conclave of 2005 was exactly what I was reading about, the beginning of the division into parties. False uh, reform. False reform. And that allows me, by the way, to use the immortal line, he spotted the serpent's tail in the Sistine Chapel. Because the serpent's tail in Ignatian spirituality is the temptation, the thing that looks, you know, you, you often can't see where the devil is tempting you, but you'll often just spot the tail, and you need to be, you know, yeah. I was thinking about the serpent's tail, and I lost my question. <laughs> the, um, it's because you're a real writer, you see. You love, <laughs> you love metaphor. I had lunch with one of my deep threads yesterday, and he said that this, the story going forward is going to be the uh, continuity between John Paul and Bergoglio with Ratzinger as the outrider in the middle. Uh, can you speak to that? Well, I mean, Paul wrote the best article on this subject, which is called A Pope in the Attic, a uh, wonderful piece um, about the extraordinary, well, what we have now, you know, two popes, as it were, an ex-pope and a pope living close to each other. And um, there are all sorts of rumors, aren't there, at the moment about the role that Pope Benedict's playing. I don't know how many of them are true and how, how many of them aren't. What I do know is that after that famous Jesuit interview in September 2013, you remember the one when he talked about battlefields, hospital, and we're too obsessed with certain doctrines, um, apparently <laughs> Pope Benedict sent him uh, that interview, a copy, a printout of that interview, with four pages of notes. <laughs> What grade did he give him? <laughs> but, you know, a B minus, I think. Wouldn't you love to see those notes? You know? 
but uh, but I'm sure. I, I mean, you can guess. I mean, you know Benedict, you know better than I do, and how he thinks. But you know, I can be sure they were things like, oh, you want to be careful here because this could be misinterpreted, or you, you need more clarity here." And I think actually Francis would have enjoyed that. You know, he would have said, "Yeah, you know, the old man is quite right. Pick him up." <laughs> he calls him the old man, el viejo, which in Argentina is a, a term of affection. Well, I spoke to a German Jesuit for that piece who said, "Look, this is." Pope Francis is a communicator on the League with the Dalai Lama and Mother Teresa. They say he's confusing us, but we know exactly what he means. So one last question, and then we'll open it to the uh, audience question. This is the question I wanted to ask you when I got uh, bewitched by the serpent's tail. You say he's invisible because uh, he's patient, he listens, uh, he's uh, not drawn to dramatic action uh, in many instances. The story you tell in the book is that this is um, owing to his habit of Jesuit discernment, that he watches and waits, and waits for the spirit, in effect, uh, to, to help him figure out what to do, often at 4 o'clock in the morning. Sure. Right now, uh, I would say that the uh, traditionalist uh, cadre in the church is uh, trying to seize the narrative and say that Francis is uh, waiting and watching, is Francis not knowing what he wants, St. Francis or Francis confusing us and so forth. Is, is he discerning and what, what's happening, especially as regard to the synod of the family? Yeah, well, the, the, synod, the synods, of course, you know, was, was a very, very important moment because, you see, the synod isn't just about the family. It's not just the issues. It's not just the fact that it's tackling these complex pastoral issues. It's the new methodology that it's pursuing. Begin with a consultation, start with reality, and then a, a discernment by the church, theological discernment, then a gathering, which we had last month uh, in October, of, of church leaders to set the agenda. Then a whole year of discussion, deliberation, and then we end up with, a, with, a, with a, the ordinary synod next year, which then produces conclusions uh, and recommendations. Now, Francis is convinced that, uh, uh, because of everything I was quoting to you earlier, and he spent his life, in a way, studying this, that a process of genuine ecclesial discernment happens when you're willing and able to live in the tension between two things which seem humanly incapable of reconciliation. For example, how do you promote and defend the indissolubility of marriage while at the same time uh, embracing and healing those uh, whose marriages have not lasted? Uh, how do you... you know, the issues that the, that the Synod was facing, and they're very complex issues. They don't admit of easy answers. And I don't think he necessarily has the answers. But what he said, what he said at the end of the, the Synod in October, beautiful speech, and it, you know, this was vintage Bergoglio, spiritual director. He was saying, live in the tension. Don't grasp at easy solutions. Avoid doctrinal inflexibility on the one hand, but don't also go with conformism to the world. Live in the tension. Now, I think actually the, 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 those who were present, I was out there for the synod. I spoke to many, many synod fathers, and they were actually deeply moved by the whole process. Uh, and they saw the fruits of it, and I think we will see the fruits of it. But there is no doubt that there is a group there in the synod who are deeply disturbed by this. Uh, and they, if you look at the voting tallies at the end, they're usually about 20 or 30. Not a huge number given that there were 190 synod fathers voting. On the other hand, a substantial you know, block uh, who, who do have deep problems with this whole process, with the Francis pontificate, because they believe that the, above all, we need clarity. You know, clarity has become, I suppose, a little bit of an idol. Now, here's where I'm going to get into hot water. I think in some cases, um, if you make clarity too much the objective of faith, then you fall into ideology, right? And what is an ideology? An ideology is a human construct and how do you spot when something has become an ideology? It's when you're dividing the world you know, into, into sharp polarities, and you're also willing to sacrifice people. Right? That's when it becomes idol and ideology. Now, I think a little bit of that has been going on, and I'm going to get myself into even more trouble now. I think it is a, particularly here in the US church, because of the culture wars that have been fought, you know, the battles that have been fought here, I think there's a feeling among many people that you know, the church had it all clear. You know, we'd resolved the problems after Vatican II. You know, we had a clear, and now Francis is messing it up again. Now, I think they genuinely feel disturbed, therefore, by this process. And I, I wonder whether uh, what is going to happen, that there will be some people, ordinary faithful people, but also bishops and cardinals and so on, 
who end up a little bit like some people in the first years, the liberals in the first years of John Paul II. You know, remember those first years of John Paul II were a deep shock to some people who had a particular view of Vatican II, and they basically went into a two-decade-long sulk. They said, this isn't, our, this isn't our pope, you know, we feel betrayed, this isn't Vatican II, and, you know, they, they, they basically, they sulked, and they didn't contribute very much. Now, I wonder whether that same thing's going to happen now. I'm beginning to hear from some people, you know, we'll, when we get a real pope back and that kind of thing. But I, I, I just, I'm convinced that this is a small minority, that actually, on the whole, the bishops are with him, and that this uh, synodal process will produce uh, the results that Francis envisages. Because I think, actually, he really has got it well thought out. That doesn't mean that certain elements of the synod might not be chaotic. And believe me, I was there. They were. <laughs> but that doesn't. But I think, overall, he knows it's all, you know, when he said to them, relax. You know, what are you worried about? You're here, cum et sum petro. You know, this is the Catholic Church, right? You know, we have the guarantee of the Holy Spirit. If what we're doing is, 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 is genuinely listening and genuinely deliberating, and we're inviting the Spirit to, to, uh, to guide us, what are we afraid of? That's what he takes from the early church councils. That's how the church develops. And what he's restoring is a mechanism in the church by which we can have something like which we had in the early church, which was councils to develop doctrine and to develop the church. So I think, uh, I think that's why I think the big reform and the big, the big change is going to be. But there's no doubt about it that for a minority of people, it is disturbing. I sure hope you're right. Where are the questions? Uh, we have time for a few questions right here. Over on the stage, right? Yes, a question over, over on this side of the room. Oh, I see you. I have a follow-up with this uh, discussion about the Synod. As you mentioned, many of the cardinals came back, American cardinals came back, and they said they, were, they welcomed um, this process, but they were deeply troubled by the confusion. And more specifically, they said they don't know what Francis expects of them. They don't know what he wants from them. And I guess my question is, um, you know, it's a common management practice to begin with the end in mind. And does Francis have an end in mind in terms of like doctrinal change, priestly celibacy, the role of women in the church, or is this discernment for discernment's sake? Great question. I don't, I don't think he has uh, a program. He's not simply, if you like, calling the synod in order for, this, for the church to, to reach the conclusions that he's already reached. He genuinely does have faith in that process of discernment. However, by choosing Cardinal Casper to give that address to the cardinals in February, and by laying very clearly the problem of the divorced and the remarried in front of the synod, um, he's saying the status quo is in, you know, we can't have what we have at the moment. We need to seek for solutions. Um, and, and so he almost throws it on to them to say, you know, now you come up with them. Uh, and, and I think he will. This is the difference between this synod and previous synods, is that after this kind of a process, if the synod fathers next October come to firm conclusions in spiritual terms, if there is a convergence of minds and hearts to a particular solution or proposal, Francis will, will accept it. Of course he will. He would respect that. Uh, much more interesting question is what happens if, you know, if the synod splits and so on and but um, just, just the first thing you mentioned about the confusion, I, I, I interviewed, I talked to Archbishop Chapu, uh, who was at one of the made those remarks in Rome, uh, and I think he was upset by the fact that he was actually talking about the confusion that was created in the media by the synod. So what he, that, he wasn't saying that the synod itself, uh, the, you know, he wasn't criticizing the synod itself, but there was no doubt that the media was confused about the synod. And, and I actually agree with him in the sense that you know, what was lacking, actually, in the synod was a proper narrative about what it really was about. Francis supplied that afterwards, but I think it should have been supplied at the beginning. But, you know, I'm a communications uh, guy, you so you'd expect me to say that. Thank you for the question. Hi. Um, this may be referred to in the book. We just commemorated the 25th anniversary of the death of the Jesuits in El Salvador at yeah. the UCA. And I'm curious if uh, the Pope happen to have known those men, or if he's ever made a statement about, about their deaths? Yeah. Um, uh, he didn't, I, I, as far as I know, he didn't know them. Um, he has referred to it. Um, 
And as you know, he's unblocked the process, the cause of canonization of Oscar Romero. I know that's two different things, but you know, he, he, is, he is deeply concerned by that. Um, I haven't, I never came across specific uh, mentions that he made of the, of the six slain Jesuits. Um, remember that, um, Yes. When did it? When did it happen? The, the exactly. That's what I was going to say. So eighty. Exactly. So uh, eighty nine. You see, by that time, uh, he was he was kind of internally exiled within the Jesuits. Was about to become a bishop. You know. So I, I think he would have he wouldn't have been part of that in any way. If it had happened while he was a provincial, I think he would have had been much more uh, closely concerned with it. Okay. Question over here. Um, my question is in regards to the conversion that Francis underwent when he became the Bishop of Rome. I've never seen a photo. I saw a photo of him smiling when he was a child, when he was 17. But as soon as he put the Roman collar on, I never have seen a photo of him smiling until he became the Bishop of Rome. So I wonder if you could speak about what happened to Francis when he became the Pope, and also about the role of silence. I think it's really profound that at his first benediction, he bows, and we, he asks people to pray over him silently. And this is a man who talks so much but uh, the role of silence in his life. Thank you. Um, there is actually a photo in the book of him as a young Jesuit smiling. Uh, uh, but, but, but however, it's a great question because actually in Argentina, um, they all say, oh look, you know, he's changed. You know, he's a different man now, he's Pope. Now there, that, that is true and it isn't true. I go into it in the book. If you go to the north part of Buenos Aires, the Barrio Norte, which is where the rich folk live, they say, oh, he never came around here. When he did, he never stayed for very long, and he never had a smile on his face. And look at him now, he's a beacon of joy. But then you go to the, 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 the poorer parts of town where he spent a lot of his time at weekends and so on, and they say, yeah, he was always smiling, he was always full of joy. And they produce their smartphones with the picture of Father Jorge, who indeed is beaming, right? The evangelical pastors with whom he used to pray <laughs> each month, that's another story kind of broken in the book, again say that's what he was like. So I think there were two Bergoglios, actually. There was the one, there was the public one, who was uncomfortable, often looked a bit dour. Uh, and then there was the, the, if you like, the private Bergoglio, who was more relaxed among the ordinary faithful people. That said, yes, he did change, and was changed by a direct spiritual experience, which he had in between the conclave, in between the Sistine Chapel after his election, and appearing on the balcony of St. Peter's. Having accepted his election, he then became overwhelmed with fear and with anxiety, understandably, about the whole weight of the office. And uh, when he went into the Pauline Chapel to pray, uh, he had an experience which he later described as an experience of light and of freedom, which changed the way he felt and has never left him since. Now, this is all, I'd say in the book, recorded actually by camera. There's a camera there recording how he looked when he went in and how he looked when he came out. And Guy Dano, who's in charge of the Vatican television, was watching all this on his screen. And he's also separately, independently described this transformation. So not only has Francis spoken about it, but it's been seen objectively. So there definitely was that experience. Uh, and certainly now, the, the, the extraordinary joy uh, that he gives off, uh, I think, is uh, certainly a result of an experience of the Holy Spirit. He is, by the way, a Jesuit who's also a charismatic. It's very, very interesting, I trace in the book, how the big development spiritually is his contact with the charismatic Catholics. Uh, and uh, he really, you know, that's a whole other talk, but key to him, key to him. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> like many other people I here, I suppose, like many other people here, I suppose, I uh, have read this book, Untying the Knot, yeah. the other... Uh, English language book that I think is widely known. Yes. If I took something away from that book, it was that he had been very troubled by uh, the dirty war and the division in the Jesuits and perhaps even his own handling of it. Uh, how do you address that? Um, I know Paul, Paul Valley. He's another Brit. Uh, and of course, I know him well. Um, and um, he wrote a book. Uh, very soon after the election, did it in a very short time. And did it by going to Buenos Aires. He didn't spend very long there, but he spoke above all to the critics, the people who on the kind of human rights uh, brigade, who I think I show in the book, ha have a mythical view about his role in the dirty war. Um, 
I don't want to go into it because it, it, is, it is kind of complex, but I basically completely disagree with Paul about his role in the Dirty War, about uh, the reason for the, for, the, for the contention, really, within the Jesuits. Um, um, I also completely disagree with Paul. Paul. Paul has a thesis, which is, or a hypothesis, which is that basically he was a conservative until he was exiled in Cordoba. Then he had a spiritual experience which turned him into a nice liberal. Now, I think he was neither conservative before, nor was he liberal after. I think you'll find from my account, and I see this having read, remember, everything he wrote and so on, I think there's a total continuity there. However, he grows, he does develop. And there's no doubt about it that Cordoba is a, has a profound impact on him as a crucifying experience. It's an experience of the third week of the spiritual exercises, which softens him in many ways. But, it doesn't but he doesn't change his, his kind of outlook. Um, so Paul and I uh, have very, very different narratives uh, about this. And, you know, put the two together and, and, you know, see what you find more persuasive is all I can say. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, by the way, on the specific issue after his election, you remember all the controversy about the two Jesuits, Jodian and Calix. Again, I really dig into that into the book. I look at all the documentation. And what I find is that actually that accusation against him came much later, not at the time. At the time, the Jesuits did not accuse him of that. Uh, the two Jesuits, I mean. But to do with the way Argentina um, was facing up to, or not facing up to, the Dirty War in the 1980s, the idea that the church was complicit in the torture and in the dictatorship became an article of faith for a particular group in Argentina. And therefore, anybody who was, if you like, not one of the bishops who had been persecuted by the regime was accused of complicity. And his role, therefore, became caught up with that narrative. And I think I show in the book that it actually just isn't true. And most other research, by the way, has also come to the same conclusion. It's been gone over endlessly uh, by human rights investigators and journalists and so on, and they've all come to the conclusion that he has absolutely nothing at all uh, to apologize for. What I'm interested in the book is where did the idea come from? Where did the myth of Bergoglio as being you know, complicit with the dictatorship, and it's very interesting where I've, there is a black legend, and it's interesting where it comes from. Uh, and uh, we have Jesuits in the audience tonight who will back me up here. When Bergoglio was made, was elected, there was a collective groan that went up from Jesuit houses across the world because of this myth, this black legend. Uh, and I hope that one of the things the book will do is, is help to the Jesuits who believe that to realize you know, that they got him wrong and why they got him wrong. Um, because, of course, actually, the Jesuits love Francis and he's been incredibly good to them uh, as a pope. And I tell the story in the book of how, as soon as he was elected, Father Nicolas, the superior general, immediately got in touch. And there was this rather wonderful reconciliation. And when I was in Argentina last October, November, I spoke to a number of old Jesuits who had been his critics in the 1980s. And he had written them handwritten letters. Pope Francis had written them handwritten letters. And they would show them to me with tears in their eyes. They were deeply, you know, and this is a reconciliation that took place after decades of silence. He had no contact at all with the society for a very long time became Pope and immediately affected this. It's rather beautiful reconciliation. The story of Francis and the Jesuits is a great story. Let's take these three questions and then uh, we'll continue outside where there are books uh, for sale and signing. Question over here first. Would you, mind would you mind discussing some of the female influences on Bergoglio's life and what role he views for women in the reform of both the Vatican and the church going forward? Um, women have played a key role in his life and uh, he enjoys the company of women, has always been influenced by women, starting with his grandmother, who was the major influence on him as in his early life, uh, also a, a Paraguayan communist who he worked with, who had a profound influence on him, various people uh, throughout his life. Um, what he said about women in the church is that we need a theology of women. Right? We don't yet have a theology of women in the church. And I think he believes that sort of, you know, um, putting women in positions of responsibility in the Vatican, although that is happening, and I'm sure he's in favor of that, doesn't take you very far. That actually what's needed is something much deeper, reflection on, uh, on the role of women in the church theologically. Um, and he said some quite provocative and quite interesting things in that respect. I spoke to various women in Argentina who knew him well, um, and they said that 
you know, actually he, women enjoy, you know, he had this tremendous respect for women as women. And that, um, uh, and he enjoys the company of women, you know. Um, and, and that's what makes him uh, actually attractive to women. He has many women friends and many women who are close to him. In fact, for the book, some very useful sources were women who are very close to him. The American Catholic writer Thomas Stork has said that for a few decades after the council, we got a run of liberal bishops. In more recent years, we've gotten a run of uh, liberal bishops. Uh, he hopes for some Catholic bishops. And something that I appreciated very much about your book was how um, you showed that, that uh, the idea that it's either or um, is not a traditional Catholic idea, that the, the Catholic upbringing, the Catholic piety, the Catholic world that he grew up in in the 30s and 40s and 50s was one that embraced both the social teaching of the church and her traditional piety. That's right. Um, and it, you did a real service, you know, in that. But I just wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how, in the years before the council, really, that contradiction didn't exist, and particularly in the Argentinian context. Thank you. And, and I, I say in the epilogue, um, uh, perhaps injudiciously, that he, he, he presents the greatest opportunity in a generation for the reconciliation of, if you like, left and right liberals and conservatives within the church. Because the division of the church into these two parties following the council uh, was, would have been a good example of what happens with false reform. You, know, you get these two uh, people who actually start to look at the lens, church, gospel, through a, through a lens, through an ideological lens. Um, and I think he, because he's always resisted that, and I, you know, he's not a liberal, he's not a conservative either, he is a radical, he's a gospel radical um, and a mystic. Um, I think he, 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 and because he also is steeped, as you say, in traditional piety, deep respect, you know, for popular religiosity, uh, which is one of the uh, differences between him and the progressive Jesuits. The progressive Jesuits were horrified by the fact that at the Colegio Maximo, you know, there were Jesuit students praying the rosary and touching images. I mean, I have a, I have a quote from a Jesuit provincial who says, you know, it's just not what we Jesuits do, you know. Uh, so was this kind of whereas Bergoglio from the very beginning is no no that's what the that's the devotion of the ordinary people that's where Christ is that's where the Holy Spirit is so I I, I think because he's able to root uh, his Catholicism in in the ordinary faithful people I think he he, he and re in resisting the ideologies and the elites um, I think he charts for us a path of reconciliation I think between the two sides in the church. Thank you very much. Uh, the books. Uh, for sale outside, and Austin will be uh, signing. Thank you very much to John Carr. Thank you to Tom Banchoff, director of the Berkshire Center, and thank you to Austin Ivory. Thank you. Thank you.